Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Heart Success Podcast. In our episode today, we will be going over the American Heart Association 2019 meeting and all the important trials. We'll start with an interview with Garima Dahia, who is going to be a cardiology fellow very soon, a third-year general internal medicine fellow at Allegheny General in Pittsburgh. And she'll go over a couple of very important trials that came out at AHA 2019 ischemia and Colcott. Following that, I'll go over some of the other trials presented during this meeting. Finally, ended with the Apple Heart Study uh, with Jalaj Garz, who is an academic electrophysiologist up at the Medical College of Wisconsin. So sit back and enjoy the rest of the episodes, and hopefully you'll enjoy listening to all this new literature that has come out, where we'll go over some of the original data and and try to try to give context to this information. Welcome to Heart Success, Garima. It's an absolute pleasure to be back, Mehak. Garima, congratulations. Garima just matched into the University of Minnesota in Minneapolis for her cardiology fellowship, so big congratulations. Thank you so much, Mehak. Uh, like I said, I've been smiling for three days straight, and I'm, I'm just so grateful to all my mentors for having reached here, and I'm very, very excited to get started with my fellowship. Yeah, no, incredible news and, and, and well-deserved, of course. Thank you so much. All right, so we are here to keep up a tradition that we started a few months ago to discuss some of the major studies that come out of these international cardiac meetings. AHA 2019 was in Philadelphia a few weeks ago. I did go to AHA on one of the days. Uh, I think I was working on the rest of the days. But uh, an incredible meeting, some very important trials came out. And I thought we'd start with the big one, yet to be published, but we still have a lot of information available, a lot of results available, and a lot of conversation ongoing between physicians, online, everywhere. So let's start with ischemia. Mac, like you said, this was one of the most um, looked forward to trials at AHA, uh, all the talk of the town, essentially. Um, the ischemia trial, uh, the goal of this trial was to evaluate routine invasive therapy compared with optimal medical therapy among patients with stable ischemic heart disease and moderate to severe myocardial ischemia or non-invasive stress testing. Uh, it was essentially an open-label parallel group randomized control trial where patients more than 20 years of age and those with moderate to severe ischemia on a non-invasive stress testing were enrolled. The way ischemia was defined was either there was more than 10% ischemia on the nuclear stress studies involving more than three segments or more than 12% ischemia on uh, cardiac MRI, again involving more than three segments, or a treadmill test involving more than 1.5 ST depression in two leads or more than two millimeter ST depression in a single lead at seven mets with angina. Mm -hmm. Patients who had more than 50% left main stenosis on coronary CTA or those with advanced CKD, those with history of ACS within the past two months, prior PCR cabbage within the past year, or those with severe LV systolic dysfunction with EF less than 35%, and those with significant angina at baseline or NYHA class 3 or 4 heart failure were excluded from the study. Eventually, uh, over the course of time, uh, about 5,200 patients were enrolled in the study with a median follow-up of 3.3 years. The median age of the patients was 64 years, of whom about 23% were females. In all, about 50% of the patients in the trial had severe inducible ischemia at baseline, 33% had moderate ischemia, and 12% had mild ischemia at baseline. That's a great point. These are pretty significant risk patients. Over 80% of the patients had moderate to severe inducible ischemia at baseline. We're talking about patients that we would, even in practice, range range within the higher risk categories where we worry about what's going to happen. And and in the past, even though we've had data showing stable disease can be treated with medications, we've always worried about this subsection of population, which is why this trial was so important. That's right, Mac. Absolutely. You know, once these patients were enrolled, it wasn't just these subject, these objective numbers that were <clears throat> used for classifying the patients in low guideline directed therapy, the local or versus invasive therapy. The local heart team, uh, you know, the group of cardiologists would evaluate the patients. There was a lot of subjectivity involved in terms of symptomatology about 
those who had significant antenatal baseline, they weren't subjective to, subjected to guideline-directed therapy and were you know, straight off sent away for invasive therapy. In all, among the enrolled patients, uh, angiogram was performed in about 96% of the invasive group versus 28% of the medical therapy group. And over the entire follow-up period, PCI was performed in 80% patients of the PCI group uh, or the invasive group versus 23% of the medical therapy group. Moving on to the study results, uh, the primary outcome of the study was uh, cardiovascular death, MI, resuscitated cardiac arrest, or hospitalizations for unstable angina or heart failure. So at 3.3 years, which was the median follow-up, this occurred in 13.3% of the patients in routine invasive group versus 15.5% in the guideline-directed medical therapy group with a non-significant p-value of 0.34. These findings were similar in multiple subgroups as well when they were stratified, you know, per those with diabetes and so on. The secondary outcomes of the study was cardiovascular death or MI. Again, non-significant difference between the two groups. 11.7% in the routine invasive group versus about 13.9% in medical therapy. All-cause death, you know, the numbers were similar, 6.4% versus 6.5%. The rate for mortality was roughly 6.5%, as you mentioned, in the overall study group, somewhat lower than, than what we expected in this quote-unquote moderate to high-risk CAD population. It's basically 2% a year, uh, what is what it averages out to. The mortality curves were nearly superimposable between the two arms. The rate for MI seemed to favor the conservative strategy more in the first two years. And then moving beyond that time point, they seemed to favor the invasive arm. Eventually, they're non-significant because they even out. It will be important to see whether we get long-term data. I know the authors or the investigators are trying to get additional funding for another five years of follow-up. The reason the rate for MI was higher in the invasive arm early on is because of Periprocedural myocardial infarctions, actually the rate for spontaneous myocardial infarction remained lower among the invasive arm. This question on periprocedural myocardial infarction and whether or not it should even be included as a primary endpoint in these studies came up recently with the publication of Excel, where there were concerns that cabbage versus PCI, the differences were really Affected by the rates of periprocedural MI in that case where cabbage had more periprocedural myocardial infarctions. This is a conversation that keeps, is an ongoing conversation. And I think future trials, whenever, when they're designed, will really have to consider whether or not this is something they want to put in the primary endpoint. Mm-hmm. And, and moving on to the quality of life outcomes, you know, I mean, this is a big important outcome because we're saying that even though it's not affecting hard endpoints, a lot of the times we're doing this for symptomatic benefit. Right. And, you know, a significant improvement in symptoms was observed in patients who had daily, weekly or monthly antenna at baseline. But of course, those who did not have these symptoms were Mm -hmm. not really affected. So, yes. And I think that was the reason the authors recognized that. And that's why there was even a crossover among patients, you know, or those who did have uh, who were initially in the guideline directed arm, the ther- medical therapy arm did cross over to PCI when they noticed that there wasn't a significant improvement in symptoms in those patients. Yeah, I know we'll talk a little bit about Orbita in just mm-hmm. a little bit, but the subsection of patients who had a greater degree of angina had much better uh, anginal relief with PCI compared to medical therapy. So, again, that's a conversation that comes up, and this is why Orbita maybe becomes important in some of these patients. Mm -hmm. But, you know, one thing that you did mention, Garima, is in this study, all patients needed left main disease ruled out. Back when we did Courage, we used coronary angiography to diagnose left main disease. This study was different in that, they used cardiac CT, I believe, in almost 80% of the patients to rule out left main disease. So how is this going to play out for really cardiac CT and, and comparing it to, you know, the role for stress and nuclear imaging? 
is is exactly mahek you know the answer sort of lies in your question itself uh, you know the fact that left vein disease was ruled out i think the patients who uh, would present initially either who've had an angiography for some other reason uh, for example you know if they presented with an acs or or needed a cath for you know preoperative cardiothoracic surgery those are the only patients who would be di- who would be diagnosed with left vein disease by angiography I think we're looking at a shift towards coronary CTA among the rest of the patients to figure out if there is significant obstructive left main disease or not. As far as the role of stress in nuclear imaging is concerned, I'm not entirely sure what direction we're going to see that head. Cardiac CT has been, uh, I would say, broadcasted as the test that's going to change diagnostic testing um, in cardiac CTA specific- specifically is going to overtake stress and nuclear imaging. That hasn't happened so far mm-hmm. for several reasons, some of it uh, really driven by reimbursement practices and what insurances will allow. Mm-hmm. But we do have data comparing cardiac CT to stress testing. You can look back at Promise. You can look back at Scott Heart. Some of mm-hmm. them even slightly favoring cardiac CT because in some of those cases, you're more aggressive starting preventative care with statins than maybe antiplatelet agents possibly uh, reducing downstream events down the line. So clearly, uh, cardiac CT versus nuclear and stress, that battle continues. I have a feeling that the practices will change if guidelines change and reimbursement practices change within the U.S. Time will tell. Right. And it just sort of brings us to our next point here. There's a little bit concern about the fact that, uh, you know, what about patients who are symptomatic who do not have identifiable obstructive disease on coronary CT? And more so, you know, the applicability of these test results in women, because that's sort of the population we're talking about here. So where do you sort of see that head, you know, the applicability among symptomatic women patients with stable angina? The trial was designed such that Patients who did not have any evidence of obstructive coronary artery disease on either uh, CT or angiography were enrolled in a separate registry, I believe, and uh, we will see more results come out from there. We know that female patients are more likely to have no obstructive coronary disease. This may be related to microvascular disease, may be related to different physiology. We don't know what uh, we should be doing for these mm-hmm. patients. We truly haven't been able to, I would say, even narrow down the true mechanism, uh, which makes it even more challenging to, to treat. I commonly will use calcium channel blockers in these patients if they have angina, just mm-hmm. for symptomatic mm-hmm. relief. I don't usually use antiplatelet agents, but there is some data maybe on some role for antiplatelet agents and statins in a select group of patients. I think a lot of this is more retrospective research Definitely not randomized control uh, level of uh, uh, information available. So it's a challenging group of patients, no question. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So earlier in the episode, you talked about uh, comparing ischemia with the Orbita trial. I just sort of like to elucidate on that a little bit. Um, the Orbita trial was, you know, a relatively smaller trial enrolling about 200 patients that uh, wanted to, that studied a PCI that results in improvement in exercise times or anginal frequency compared with a placebo procedure despite the presence of anatomically or functionally significant stenosis. So essentially in this trial, patients were patients with stable angina or anginal equivalence in at least one angiographically significant lesion, so defined as more than 70% stenosis, they were deemed as clinically feasible or appropriate for PCI. You know, angiographic stenosis of more than 50% in a non-target vessels, similar to the ischemia trial, were not included. And again, patients with ACS, left main disease, severe LV dysfunction, those with CTO and pulmonary hypertension were excluded from this trial. The primary uh, outcome of this trial, as opposed to ischemia, where we were looking at uh, MACE outcomes, in this trial, we were sort of aiming at what the symptomatic outcomes are. So a change in exercise time and a change in the Duke treadmill score in the Seattle Angina questionnaire and complete freedom from angina. These were sort of the primary and secondary outcomes of the study. Primary outcome, which is the change in exercise time, there was a non-significant difference between the two groups, so the p-value of 0.2. 
But as far as the secondary outcome was concerned, which is complete freedom from angina, the difference was 49.5% versus 31% in PCI versus the placebo procedure. It's a significant p-value. So this sort of goes on to agree with the that among patients with stable angina, PCI, while it may not result in great improvements in exercise time, it does result in freedom from angina. Yeah. Like you said, the one important thing that came out later was when they published their functional stenosis data really using FFR, really mm-hmm. found no difference. FFR did not seem to direct whether or not it would lead to resolution in angina. So a lot of questions came out of Orbita. It was a great trial actually done, challenging mm-hmm. the norm that uh, we can't do sham controlled PCI trials today. So the authors did mm-hmm. it. And I think, mm-hmm. I believe that we'll be doing a larger trial. There's a placebo effect that comes into play when patients know, the doctors know, there is significant stenosis. And doing a sham arm uh, for control takes some of that effect away and, and really exposes the true difference between the two. So thanks, Garima, for that excellent mm-hmm. summary of Orbita. Uh, right, Mehak. Uh, the Courage trial is, you know, the next one. It's the next question that comes to mind. A lot of, uh, you know, cardiologists before this senior trial even came out, you know, especially those who had trained in the post-courage era, argued that uh, the evidence that ischemia is going to prevent is already in uh, agreement with their practices because, you know, they were trained post-courage, you know, once those results were out. And this is a trial that was conducted in 2007 that, again, found no benefit with revascularization uh, with PCI over guideline-directed medical therapy in patients with stable coronary disease through 15 years of follow-up. Freedom from angina occurred slightly more frequently uh, with the P- with PCI early on in the trial, but it did not occur. Uh, there was no significant difference between these two groups around at five years follow-up, with both arms showing reduction in angina. There were a few criticisms of courage trial, and uh, the issue with the courage trial was a uh, majority of patients in PCI received bare metal stents because uh, drug eluting stents were not approved until six, the final six months of the study period. And there was no stratification of patients by ischemic burden, the way we've seen in the ischemia trial with, you know, severe, moderate or mild ischemia. And, uh, you know, with regard to the use of antiplatelet agents, it wasn't entirely certain how long patients were using dual antiplatelet therapy, more so clopidogrel and uh, unclear use of GP2V3A inhibitors. There was a, a, also a little bit of concern about, the, concern about the fact that patients were randomized after angiography, potentially biasing the results, and there were considerable crossovers in the COURAGE trial. So, you know, that's the reason that despite us having, you know, a randomized control trial along similar lines, we were sort of looking for more concrete evidence with uh, which the ischemia trial provided to us. Uh, and it failed to show that routine invasive therapy would be associated with reduction in major adverse ischemic events compared with opti- optimal medical therapy among patients with stable CAD and moderate severe ischemia. Mm-hmm. Great summary of all these trials. I think uh, maybe we can conclude that stenting reduces angina, but that's all mm-hmm. we can say for stable coronary artery disease. The hard outcomes, uh, which are usually the scary outcomes, you know, MIs, cardiovascular death, or death in general, doesn't really seem to be impacted. For the Mm -hmm. crossover, I think what you mentioned was very important. These trials do have some crossover, you know, like you said, courage and ischemia both had what I believe roughly seven to eight percent crossover per year, which again is part of clinical practice. I think if you have continued angina despite medical therapy, very reasonable to to consider PCI in those patients for angina relief. I believe this is a practice-changing trial. I know several people argue that it isn't true. Over time, we'll see if these centers that say that this is always how they've been practicing will actually release their their data, honestly, to say that, you know, all their patients who had moderate to severe ischemia were tried on medical therapy, titrated on medical therapy. After courage, the rate for stable PCI did drop in practice, and I have a feeling it's going to happen after ischemia. Again, we'll we'll find out Mm -hmm. over time. Sometimes what the patient expectations are also sort of has a role to play in how the physician is driving their treatment, about patients being afraid that they do have severe ischemia and a stress test, and they tend to be wary about the fact that their physician is not going ahead and recommending that we open up that lesion. 
I, I must say I was very impressed by the sort of news and media coverage that this article received, even for that layman, you know, the patient who's out there, for, you know, reading and for them to find out that stenting is not always the answer. Yeah, so there's a lot of people picking very extreme sides, which is unfortunate how mm -hmm. uh, news has captured these events. You know, there was a subset of patients that were enrolled into a separate trial, ischemia CKD, which mm -hmm. will be going on, which will be going over later. So moving on to the next big trial that was published, the Colcott trial. And maybe you could uh, tell us about this trial. Yes, absolutely, Mehek. Um, the goal of the Kulkar trial was to evaluate whether low-dose colchicine was effective at preventing major adverse cardiovascular events compared with placebo within 30 days of an MI. Uh, it was a double-blind parallel group randomized controlled trial where patients uh, within 30 days in completion of all planned PCI, those were included in the trial. Uh, those with type 2 MI, again, severe systolic LV dysfunction of less than 35%, history of stroke within the past three months or cabbage within the past three years, uh, those with history of inflammatory bowel disease, chronic diarrhea, neuromuscular disease, significant hepatic or renal disease, which is defined as creatinine more than two times normal, drug or alcohol abuse, or those with uh, long-term systemic steroid use, or, sense, or history of sensitivity to colchicine were excluded from the trial. About 4,700 patients were enrolled in the trial and split equally between the two groups, receiving either colchicine 0.5 milligrams a day or placebo, and they were followed up at various intervals, one month, three months, and every three months for about a follow-up period of three and a half years. The median duration of follow-up was 22.6 months. The mean patient age was 61 years, of whom about 19% were female, 20% were diabetic. 93% uh, of the enrolled patients did go PCI, did undergo PCI for this index MI hospitalization. And a majority of these patients were already using, you know, the numbers are close to 97 to 99% were using either aspirin, a second antiplatelet agent, and a statin respectively. The primary endpoint of the study was a composite of deaths from cardiovascular causes, resuscitated cardiac arrest, MI, stroke, or urgent hospitalizations for angina requiring uh, revascularization. It occurred in 5.5% of the patients in colchicine group compared to 7.1% in the placebo group with a significant p-value of 0.02. As far as the secondary outcomes were concerned, uh, with regard to cardiovascular death, uh, it was similar between the two groups, 0.8% versus 1% with a non-significant p-value. With regard to stroke, uh, it was impressively different between the two groups, about 0.2% in colchicine versus 0.8% in placebo, with a p-value less than 0.05. And with regard to urgent hospitalization for unstable angina requiring revascularization, it occurred in 1.1% in the colchicine group versus 2.1% in placebo group uh, with a, you know, a significant p-value. So one could almost say that the significant difference in the primary endpoint we are seeing is predominantly being driven by decrease in urgent rehospitalization for unstable angina and stroke. With regard to the adverse events, uh, diarrhea was reported in 9.7% of the colchicine group versus 8.9% in placebo with a non-significant p-value. But unfortunately, there was a, a serious adverse event of pneumonia that occurred in 0.9% of colchicine group versus 0.4% in placebo, P of 0.03. You know, I'm not entirely sure about the severity of pneumonia in terms of whether they required inpatient treatment or uh, they were sent home on antibiotics and what sort of antibiotic coverage was provided to these patients. Mm -hmm. I was surprised that the grade of diarrhea was very similar in both mm -hmm. groups. And it was under 10% overall. So it seems fairly safe with respect to the GI side effects or at least diarrhea. Mm -hmm. So I think the numbers played out like you said. The absolute difference for primary endpoint driven by stroke and urgent hospitalization for unstable angina. 1.6% absolute difference. Number needed to treat of 62 over 22 months. And the harm really primarily being higher rates of pneumonia. The number needed to harm is 200 because the absolute difference is 0.5%. So that's really how I think the numbers played out. And maybe you could just conclude what this study showed and maybe put it into some context 
on this inflammatory hypothesis that has come to light in the last few years. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, Mehek. To sort of piece this all together, among patients with a recent MI, um, if they're enrolled in the in the peri MI period, that is within 30 days of the event, Lodo's colchicine, because of his anti-inflammatory properties, it does effectively prevent major adverse cardiovascular events compared with placebo. And, uh, you know, like I said, this benefit is predominantly driven by reduction in the incidence of urgent hospitalizations for unstable angina needing revascularization and in a reduction in the incidence of stroke. For the most part, the study drug was well tolerated. You know, the trial was based off of the hypothesis of anti-inflammatory properties, for which we've seen trials in the past as well. Predominantly, two trials come to mind, which is the Ludoco trial that also looked at colchicine and the Cantos trial that looked at uh, canacumumab, sorry, canacumumab, monoclonal, <laughs> the monoclonal antibody. So I'll start with the Ludoco trial, because it was sort of similar to this one in the sense that they also enrolled uh, say, uh, patients between two groups, a low dose of colchicine at 0.5 milligram versus a placebo. And they did see a reduced risk of cardiovascular events in the setting of stable CAD. At the time in Lodoco, you know, they included patients with angiographic proof of CAD, uh, you know, those with uh, 35 to 85 years of age who had been clinically stable for over six months. And I think that is an important point to note here is that the patient population, though the hypothesis was similar, the population was different between these two studies. Lodoco predominantly looked at patients with stable CAD who had been okay for at least six months, as opposed to Colcott enrolling patients within 30 days of MI. Other than that, in Lodoco, patients were randomized in a similar one-to-one fashion uh, to receive either colchicine or placebo. They enrolled about 530 patients at the time, uh, you know, similar distribution between the two groups. Uh, and they had a median follow-up of three years. Their primary outcome was ACS, cardiac arrest or stroke in the two arms. And it was found to be significantly lower in colchicine compared to placebo with uh, the incidence being 5.3% in the colchicine arm versus 16% in the placebo arm, uh, and a hazard ratio of 0.33 and a significant p-value of you know, less than 0.01. This was driven mainly by a reduction in the de novo or non-stent-related ACS, uh, with incidence being 3.2% versus 12%. But this reduction in the endpoint was similar among all their subgroups, uh, irrespective of age or presence of comorbidities like diabetes. You know, the Ludoka trial was sort of, it was at the time, it was deemed as this hypothesis-generating trial and uh, you know, which brought forward the anti-inflammatory properties of colchicine. And it was sort of along these lines that we now are looking at the results of the Colcott trial. And the next trial that, you know, that with similar uh, hypothesis was the Cantos trial that looked at anti-inflammatory therapy for uh, therosclerotic disease. It in fact, looked at canakinumab rather than colchicine. And this was a randomized control trial uh, that looked at this uh, monoclonal antibody that typically targets interleukin-1b. And it had a pretty large patient enrollment of about 10,000 patients with history of prior MI and high sensitivity CRP of more than two. In this study, you know, the difference with therapy with the monoclonal antibody, it was effective. It was wonderful when it came to preventing adverse cardiac events with over a follow-up of 3.7 years. The significance in that group was seeing the patients receiving higher doses of the group at 150 milligrams of the antibody with a significant p-value, a difference in the primary outcome. The reason that study sort of where it fell short and raised concern was the fact that it was associated with a significantly high risk of fatal infection or sepsis, despite exclusion of patients who had, you know, history of recurrent infections and so on. Thanks, Marina. That, that's a great summary on this uh, inflammatory hypothesis uh, really started by, like you said, Lodoco and Kanekimumab. Colchicin use in practice, like you mentioned, you know, point five milligrams daily seems relatively safe. Mm-hmm. I will add that colchicin has significant drug interactions. So whenever you're using it in practice, you want to make sure that you're not using high doses of statin and high doses of amlodipine. I believe those are the big two. Then all the CYP3A4 agents as well have significant interactions. So 
if we're going to get more comfortable using this drug, we'll have to be more mindful of the different drug interactions that come with using colchicine. Mm-hmm. Right. So just to sort of uh, conclude our discussion on the Colcott trial, it is the first trial that has provided strong evidence for the role of anti-inflammatory agents, which is colchicine, in preventing risk of uh, these cardiovascular events in the acute post-MI period. While we did discuss three positive trials, Colcott, Lodoco, and Cantos, two with colchicine, one with canakinumab, There was another trial that was negative earlier this year that was presented, I I believe, at ACC or right before and uh, published in the New England Journal of Medicine in February of this year. That was the CIRT trial, C-I-R-T, looking at the use for low-dose methotrexate for for preventing atherosclerotic events. Canakinumab works by lowering inflammation and neutralizing interleukin-1-beta. That's how we think the mechanism to reducing MACE events really comes from. Now, methotrexate, among patients with stable atherosclerosis, low-dose methotrexate did not reduce any cardiovascular events compared to placebo. The trial was conducted in 4,786 patients with previous MI or multivessel coronary disease who additionally had either type 2 diabetes or metabolic syndrome All participants received one milligram of folate daily, primary endpoint being non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke or cardiovascular death, and near the conclusion of the trial, but before unblinding hospitalization for unstable angina that led to urgent revascularization was later added as a primary endpoint. The patients were followed for a median of 2.3 years, and the final endpoint occurred in 201 patients in the methotrexate group compared to 207 in the placebo group really hazard ratio of 0.96, no significance between the two arms. Even when you look at the original primary endpoint, excluding the hospitalization for unstable angina, there was no difference. The hazard ratio there was 1.01. They found that methotrexate was associated with elevations in liver enzyme levels, reductions in leukocyte counts and hematocrit counts, and a higher incidence of non-basal cell skin cancer compared to placebo. One of the arguments as to why methotrexate didn't work, however, canakinumab did, the mechanism seems to be quite different in how they inhibit inflammation. Methotrexate specifically did not lower interleukin-1-beta, interleukin-6, or C-reactive proteins compared to placebo, all of which are lowered by canakinumab. Just for completion's sake, I thought I'd mention how there was another trial within the inflammatory hypothesis that was negative bringing forward the point that how we inhibit seems to be quite important as well. I'll be going over some of the other late-breaking trials that were presented at AHA 2019. Let me start with DAPA heart failure. We've been talking about SGLT2 inhibitors in several episodes prior to this. We are also breaking the Diabetal Cardiology series to release this episode So if you've been listening to the previous two episodes, you'll hear a lot more about this this drug. DAPA heart failure was performed among patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction. The original results were published in the New England Journal of Medicine and originally presented in September, I believe, at ESC 2019. Some other results were presented here at AHA. This study evaluated the safety and efficacy of dapagliflozin, which is an SGLT2 inhibitor, among patients with heart failure and reduced ejection fraction with and without type 2 diabetes. It's important to know that 55% of the patients in this study did not have diabetes. It is a phase 3 randomized double-blinded parallel comparison of dapagliflozin 10 milligrams per day compared to standard therapy plus placebo and uh, over 4,700 heart failure reduced ejection fraction patients were evaluated from over 20 countries with a median follow-up of 18 months. The primary endpoint for this study was a composite of worsening heart failure or cardiovascular death. The results showed that among patients with and without type 2 diabetes, 
when you added dapagliflozin to your standard HUFREF therapy, it actually significantly reduced the risk for composite primary endpoint. When you look at the individual endpoints, it actually reduced both CV death and reduced worsening heart failure. It's important to know that while the primary endpoints were significant and there was an absolute risk reduction of 5%, which is quite large, all components had improved, including some of the secondary endpoints, which remained all-cause death, quality of life, and renal function. As we now know, SGLT2 inhibitors are nephroprotective. The effect these drugs had were independent of hemoglobin A1C, and the, and the best part was that the Kaplan-Meier curves were still diverging when the study was completed. Additionally, this was an excellent trial because more than 70% of the patients were on mineralocorticoid receptor antagonists. That is the highest of any previous randomized control trial in heart failure and reduced ejection fraction to have such a high proportion of patients on MRAs. Only 11% had sasubitril valsartan, so that's a relatively small proportion of patients that, that were on Entresto at the time really minimal uh, side effects and very few adverse events. I think the concern remains the high cost associated with these drugs, but this data does suggest that we may want to start including this drug in our primary guideline-directed medical therapy. It becomes the fourth class of drug for HUFREF with a clear mortality benefit, which is quite significant. If you're not convinced with this trial, there's several other studies that are coming out, including in reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction, several large randomized control trials. So I look forward to those. The next trial to go over was Orion 10 in Clisseron for subjects with ASCVD and elevated LDL cholesterol. I think we have significant evidence showing how LDL lowering is one of the most effective interventions that lower ASCVD risk scores, primarily achieved with the use of statins, in some cases use of ezetimibe and use of PCSK9 inhibitors. Inclisiron is a small interfering double-stranded RNA there's more studies coming out with these siRNA inhibitors, especially I think in the amyloid field as well. So this is a new type of mechanism that we're, we're going to see more and more. And this specific siRNA inhibitor actually inhibits production of PCSK9 and hepatocytes. There is some early data showing that using injection, so sub-Q injection of in Clisseron, only twice yearly, which is really one every six months, results in significant reductions in LDL in the range of 30 to 50 percent within the first 30 days of the first injection. And this reduction in LDL is maintained for the duration of the study. In the first Orion 1 dose study, actually, they gave the first injection at day 1, of course, followed by the second injection at day 90. So this is a drug that we could give every few months, making it a lot easier to prescribe and making compliance a lot easier with maintained low LDL levels. In this specific study, Patients were randomized 1 is to 1 to 300 milligrams of inclisiron versus placebo with maximally tolerated statins. The injection was given on day 1, day 90, day 270, and day 450. And the patients were followed for at least 90 days following the last dose, so all the way to day 540. Patients really had an LDL of 70 or more while on maximally tolerated doses or documented intolerance 
and these were all adults over the age of 18, 18 months and above. And uh, ezetimib was also allowed in these patients. They did exclude heart failure reduced ejection fraction patients. They excluded patients who were planned to get PCSK9 inhibitors, patients with severe uncontrolled hypertension or, or severe non-cardiovascular disease were excluded. Additionally, those with very high fasting triglycerides of over 400 milligrams per milliliter were excluded. They screened a, a total of 2,329 patients, ended up randomizing 1,561 patients with almost 90% follow-up data in both arms. Patient median age was mid-60s, 70% uh, male, 42% with diabetes. Roughly 90% of patients in both placebo and treatment arms were on a statin. Roughly 10% were on ezetimib. The baseline LDL was 105 in both arms. That is the mean LDL. What they showed was that inclisiron resulted in a 56% reduction in LDL compared to really no difference in the placebo arm as you would expect because they didn't get any treatment. They also showed that this percent change in LDL was achieved early, most of it within the first 90 days of treatment, and was maintained with serial injections. I think what the regimen typically uh, is, is you give one at day one right away, then you give one at three months, and then every six months from there on. Really no difference in the adverse event profile compared to placebo in both arms. The injection site adverse events were mostly mild and the site reactions really being erythema, rash, pruritus, or hypersensitivity seen in 2.6% of the patients getting in glycerin compared to 0.9% in the placebo arm. Injection site pain was seen roughly in 3.1% of the patients getting in glycerin compared to 0.5% in the placebo arm. So very low rates of injection site pain and injection site reactions. No difference in liver function, kidney function, creatine kinase, or platelet levels in either studies. There was really no signal for any other serious cardiovascular event concerns as well in either arm. And most of these adverse events, as I mentioned, were not significant enough to warrant a greater degree of drug discontinuation in the treatment arm. Overall, roughly 2.5% of the patients needed drug discontinuation for in the treatment arm. It was 2.2% in the placebo arm. The trial was never powered to study um, improvement in clinical event rates. Uh, when they did show the all-cause mortality, it was very low in the overall study population, as you would have expected, and there was no difference. It was really 1.4% in the placebo arm versus 1.5% in the inclusion arm. The trial um, investigators did mention that in an exploratory basket of cardiovascular events, they found that the actual number of cardiovascular events was numerically lower within the inclusion arm than placebo, really just hypothesis generating. Honestly, if this ends up being somewhat cheap, hard to say until it comes out, and is only needed every six months, it is really something that we could use in practice quite reliably to maintain LDL reductions. I don't think it should replace statins based on the information we have so far, but who knows what, what, what kind of data comes on down the line. Very, very promising new avenue of treatment. Another study presented was one that continued to test the HDL hypothesis in patients with coronary artery disease. This study looked at apa betalone, um, which is a BET 
protein inhibitor, BET protein inhibitor, ends up increasing apolipoprotein A gene expression and increased apolipoprotein A levels also increases HDL levels. So this was a study called Bet on Mace, which looked at whether use of apabetalone would increase the time to mace major adverse cardiovascular events in high-risk patients with recent acute coronary syndrome, type 2 diabetes, and a low HDL level. It was a phase 3 multi-center double-blinded placebo-controlled trial that enrolled 2,425 patients. They really did include very high-risk population, and patients were randomized to high-intensity statin therapy using really either atorvastatin or rosuvastatin in addition to using a BET inhibitor, which is apobetalone, and the other arm really had high-intensity statin plus placebo. They followed the patients uh, for roughly 26.5 months, and unfortunately, there was really no difference in the overall event rate between the two groups. In fact, the primary endpoint of major adverse cardiovascular events, including CV death, non-fatal MI or stroke, occurred in 125 patients in the treatment arm compared to 149 patients in the placebo arm. The absolute difference was 2.1% reduction. 10.3% um, versus 12.4% were the actual numbers. And the uh, hazard ratio was 0 0.82 with a p-value of 0 0.11. They did perform a sensitivity analysis, which also narrowly missed its p-value. I think the conclusion of the study was that apobetalone does not decrease CV death, non-fatal MI or stroke, compared to placebo in diabetic patients with recent acute coronary syndrome. I think it is an interesting study, though there was a signal for benefit, we just didn't have enough data here to, to argue strongly that this is something we could use in practice. If you look at the actual rates of CV death and uh, all-cause death, all-cause death was 5% in the treatment arm versus 6% in the placebo arm, so really very little difference. Most of this difference was actually from CV death, which was 3.7% versus 4.6%. Maybe we'll hear a little bit more about this drug class over time, uh, considering that, like we discussed, this is a high-risk group of patients with diabetes and really low HDL levels, really less than 40 in men and 45 or less in women uh, was the inclusion criteria. Let me talk about the ischemia CKD trial. The ischemia CKD trial was a branch out from the original ischemia trial. These patients were not included in the ischemia trial, but when they were evaluated for inclusion in the initial trial and actually had significant CKD, ended up getting randomized into a separate RCT. This study was actually very important because we've never really had very good data for revascularization in patients with advanced chronic kidney disease. It filled a very important deficiency that existed in the literature. The study included patients with moderate or severe ischemia and a GFR of less than 30 millimeters, milliliters, or the patients were on dialysis. Patients were randomized in a one-to-one -one fashion to either an invasive strategy or a conservative strategy. The conservative strategy was, of course, optimal medical therapy alone, using only cath or revascularization with OMT failure. The invasive strategy, of course, 
included use of optimal medical therapy plus catheterization and optimal revascularization when suitable. The primary endpoint was a composite of death and myocardial infarction. These patients also had at least moderate ischemia on an exercise or pharmacological stress test that led to inclusion. This study did not include patients who had significant NYHA class 3 or 4 heart failure or an EF of less than 35% or very severe angina that was not controlled on medical therapy at baseline, recent acute coronary syndrome within the last two months or bypass or PCI within 12 months. So the other thing they did very efficiently was they used an LVEDP-based hydration algorithm to minimize kidney injury risk because these were patients, as you can imagine, who still had some kidney function, were getting dye for cardiac catheterization. So they used customized hydration. They really included a heart-kidney team approach to come up with the best strategy for minimizing renal risk. And another interesting thing that they did was they used ultra-low or really zero-contrast PCI using imaging and physiology guidance in a lot of cases without contrast use. So this is another very exciting aspect that developed out of this trial on the feasibility of using minimal to no contrast and supplementing your catheterization with some of these imaging and physiology guidance to, to minimize contrast use. This study in, in eventually studied 777 patients, and uh, 388 were randomized to the invasive arm, 389 were randomized to the conservative arm, they basically had follow-up data on 99.2 and 99.7% of, of the patients, which is incredible. Basically, they had follow-up data on almost everybody who was included in the trial with a median follow-up of roughly two and a half years for survivors. Um, patient median age was roughly 60 through 62, uh, 63, 62 years, 31% uh, females. 90% plus hypertension, high 50% having some diabetes, median ejection fraction being 58% in the study. Half the patients actually were on dialysis. Among those on dialysis, the median duration on dialysis for these patients was two years, the interquartile range being one to five years, mostly hemodialysis in, in over 80% of the patients. So going into what kind of disease uh, these patients had, the, the stress test severity showed severe ischemia in 38% of the overall studied population and moderate ischemia in the 62%. When they looked at the number of patients with significant stenosis, it actually turns out that 74% of the patients had one or more vessels involved. So 26% of the patients didn't have any significant, at least more than 50% stenosis of their coronary artery disease. 22% one vessel, 28% uh, two vessel, and then 23% three vessel disease. 57% of these patients had LAD involvement, and then 44 and 45% had left circumflex and right coronary artery involvement respectively. There's obviously some overlap because patients had more than one vessel disease in several cases. There was a high rate of statin use, you know, mid mid 80% statin use. And, and if you look at over the study, actually more patients ended up getting on statin as well. And then patients um, had reasonably well controlled blood pressure. A lot of them were non-smokers and uh, over 80% again were on some antiplatelet therapies for the duration of this study. When you look at how many patients underwent revascularization, within the intervention arm first, it looks like roughly 85% underwent coronary angiography compared to 
in the conservative arm, which is because of crossover, obviously. And revascularization, 50% of the patients in the invasive arm underwent some kind of revascularization, relatively low compared to even the main study. And 12% in the conservative arm underwent some kind of revascularization. The strategy for revascularization was PCI in 85% of the patients and 15% underwent bypass. The primary endpoint was basically superimposable. The Kaplan Meier curves are just on top of each other for the duration of this study. The hazard ratio was 1.01, p value 0.95. So for the primary endpoint of death or MI, conservative versus invasive strategy had no difference. The major secondary endpoint, which was cumulative of other events, which is death, MI, hospitalization for unstable angina or heart failure, or resuscitated cardiac arrest, really no different, p-value 0.93. Mortality, no different. CV death, no different. Myocardial infarction, no different. Interestingly, when you look at the rate for stroke, you would see that the rate of stroke was actually much higher among patients who within the invasive arm. And this, this was seen over the duration of the study, and the curves kept diverging over time. It is hard to explain why the risk of stroke kept accumulating over time compared to you would have expected early on after um, the PCI. Could it be chance? Certainly possible. The hazard ratio for this was 3.76 with a p-value of 0.004. So basically, the invasive arm caused significantly higher risk of stroke. No difference in the overall rate for unstable angina. No difference in the overall rate for heart failure. No difference in procedural MI or spontaneous MI. As you can imagine, the risk for Death or new dialysis was slightly higher among patients who underwent invasive strategy. To conclude it, they showed that uh, there was maybe, if anything, a harm to using an invasive strategy among patients with severe CKD and moderate to severe ischemia on stress testing. If you look at the final forest plot when this study was presented at AHA, there's one one uh, specific subsection which draws interest, and that shows that while there was a difference, uh, maybe showing harm for invasive, using an invasive strategy uh, for the overall population, there seemed to be some benefit, still doesn't cross the midline, but the lines are, are moving towards favoring an invasive strategy when there's severe ischemia on your stress test and using a conservative strategy when there is moderate ischemia on stress test. This is a trial that was certainly surprising in what it showed. Uh, we have seen that commonly patients who are undergoing renal transplant evaluation will get stress tests routinely. And if you have abnormalities on these stress tests, you do get cardiac catheterizations, possibly even interventions. We've been doing this for many years I would argue, and, and so have many others, that these results should put pause to these current practices and make all renal transplant programs reevaluate whether they should be focusing more on getting these patients on statins, antiplatelet agents, some of the other drugs that were used in this population, because it seems to be fairly effective. Finally, I will uh, end by saying that while the overall event rate in ischemia was not that high, as you would have expected, this was a much sicker group of patients. The overall rate for the primary endpoint, uh, which was death or MI, was actually seen in roughly 40% of the patients at by the by four years when you look at the Kaplan-Meier curves. Basically, we're saying that if you're not someone who had a recent ACS, recent revascularization for other reasons, or 
did not have severe angina to begin with, maybe we shouldn't start going looking for ischemia in these patients and possibly even stop doing these stress tests because they don't seem to give us a direction on what to do next. And instead of just focus on putting everybody on medical therapy. Of course, that's not what the study looked at, but I, I don't think it's not it's an unreasonable take-home point from this study. Briefly mention the next study, which was the Galileo trial. It was a global comparison of rivaroxaban-based antithrombotic strategy versus an antiplatelet-based strategy following TAVR to optimize clinical outcomes. The key finding, no, the, the final finding of this study was actually that there were more complications with rivaroxaban use compared to just antiplatelet use among TAVR patients, especially when there was no indication for anticoagulation, highlighting that routine anticoagulation with rivaroxaban is not needed in the absence of another indication. It was a multi-center study with over 1,600 patients that were randomized, and the treatment arm was within a week after TAVR, patients without any indication for oral anticoagulation were randomized to receive either rivaroxaban 10 milligrams daily, plus aspirin 75 to 100 milligram once daily for 90 days, followed by rivaroxaban 10 milligrams daily alone in the treatment arm. Control arm included dual antiplatelet with Plavix 75 milligrams, aspirin 75 to 100 milligrams daily for 90 days, followed by just leaving them on aspirin. Of course, patients were old. This is 80 to 81 uh, was the average patient age. So these patients are at a high risk for bleeding. And the primary composite efficacy endpoint was time to all cause death, stroke, MI, or thromboembolic events, which was significantly higher in the rivaroxaban arm. The all-cause mortality was significantly higher, a hazard ratio 1.69 p-value of 0.009, and even the safety uh, endpoint was significantly higher, favoring antiplatelet arm. Really, more bleeding was seen within the rivaroxaban arm, though that did not reach statistical significance. The trial, as you can imagine, was stopped early because of these safety concerns and DSMB recommendation. There was a sub-study done within the Galileo trial where subclinical hypoattenuated leaflet thickening and reduced leaflet motion of the bioprosthetic aortic valves was demonstrated using 4DCT. This opens up the whole area of subclinical leaflet thrombosis, which has been one of the concerns leading to a higher risk for stroke and whether or not these patients should be anticoagulated. So this sub-study also was done with the specific purpose of assessing whether this is a subgroup that may benefit from use of rivaroxaban. And the definition was at least grade 3 to 4 restricted leaflet motion, basically saying that the leaflet was at least 50 to 75% restricted, which is moderately restricted, or severely restricted, largely immobile, more than 75% restriction. So significant restriction was, was mandated for you to be evaluated under this specific arm of the study. The primary endpoint of this study was to look at the proportion of patients with at least one prosthetic valve leaflet with reduced leaflet motion of grade 3 or higher, basically significant restriction in motion, and as you would have expected, the patients who had rivaroxaban had a significantly lower rate of restricted leaflet motion, 2.1% compared to 10.9% in the antiplatelet arm for patients uh, that had this information available. The p-value for this difference was 0.014. The risk ratio was 0.19. When you look at the clinical outcomes, however, the bleeding was much higher among patients who received rivaroxaban. In this study, when they looked at the clinical outcomes, it was 3.5% compared to 0.9% in rivaroxaban versus antiplatelet agents. Thromboembolic event rate was also higher among patients on rivaroxaban, 3.5% versus 1.5%. All in all, really very few clinical event rate to permit any assessment 
of the impact of um, seeing restricted leaflet motion on clinical clinical outcomes. And the authors really concluded that the clinical outcomes in the main Galileo trial should really be considered for making this decision. The conclusion remains that a rivaroxaban-based strategy is associated with a high risk for death and thromboembolic complications and high risk for bleeding uh, in the main Galileo trial. We'll end with one of the final studies uh, that was primarily primarily came out of uh, Seoul, Korea. This was actually a very important study because this is something you see in clinical practice all the time. What do you do with patients who have asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis? Do you go to surgery? Do you wait for symptoms to develop? Do you exercise these patients to see if they have symptoms? And we've never really had a good answer until maybe this stri these trial results were presented. So I think there was clinical equipoise here whether we should just have watchful obser observation uh, in these asymptomatic patients or whether we should go to AVR right away. So it's called the recovery trial. It was a prospective multi-center, open label, randomized trial comparing long-term clinical outcomes of early surgical AVR versus conservative management in asymptomatic patients with very severe aortic stenosis. It's important to know that these were patients with very severe aortic stenosis. Very severe aortic stenosis is actually a higher level of severity where the calculated valve area, aortic valve area, is less than or equal to 0.75 centimeters square. Your peak aortic jet velocity is more than or equal to 4.5 meters per second, or your mean gradient across the aortic valve is more than or equal to 50 millimeters of mercury. So these are all a little bit uh, worse than just severe aortic stenosis. They obviously did not include patients who had symptoms or had an EF of less than 50%, had significant mitral valve disease, had significant aortic regurgitation, or had previous cardiac surgery or a positive exercise test. So they really had patients with uh, very severe AS, no symptoms, and um, who went straight away to ABR versus observation and moving to surgery when symptoms develop. The primary endpoint uh, was a cumulative endpoint of either operative mortality or cardiovascular death. And then the secondary endpoints were all-cause death, repeat aortic valve surgery, clinical thromboembolic events, or hospitalization for heart failure. When they looked at these patients, uh, they had a, a, over a thousand patients initially, which mostly were symptomatic, as you can imagine. So most of these very severe AS patients, out of 1,031 patients, 758 had symptoms. So that narrowed it down to 273 asymptomatic patients. And then when you applied the exclusion criteria I mentioned above, they ended up randomizing 145 patients to early surgery or conventional therapy. The mean age of these patients was mid-60s. Half were male. Overall rate for hypertension, 55%. Diabetes, roughly 10 to 18%. So were somewhat lower uh, scores. Again, this is a non-Western population. A lot of these patients had bicuspid valve disease. You know, it looks like Conventional arm had 54% bicuspid valve disease as the cause for aortic stenosis versus 67% in the surgical arm. So that's why it explains why some of these patients were younger. The surgery was performed in 99% of the patients within the surgical arm. And early surgery really in 96% of the patients was performed. Among in the conventional arm, in the end, 74% of the patients did undergo surgery. Most of them underwent surgery a little bit later, though. They used mechanical prosthesis in roughly 40 to 50% of the patients. Bypass grafting was done in very low fraction, 2 to 7% of the patients. And the aorta needed replacement in 10 to 15% of the patients. The overall event rate for 
complications and mortality was very low. There were basically no deaths, no operative mortality in either arm in this study. All patients survived their surgery. There was one stroke in the early surgery arm. There was one MI in the conventional treatment arm. And there was no need for reoperation in any arm. So the primary endpoint for either operative or cardiovascular death was 1.4% in the early surgery arm compared to 15.3% in the conventional arm. All-cause mortality uh, at the end of the study duration was 6.8% in the surgery arm versus 20.8% in the conventional arm. Both of these were clinically, uh, sorry, statistically significant with p-values of less than 0.05. Like I mentioned, relatively low rates for complications. Interestingly, numerically, the strokes were still higher within the conventional arm. And heart failure hospitalization, as you may expect, was also numerically higher in the conventional arm. Really no heart failure hospitalization in the early surgical arm. So very, very interesting results showing that surgery has gotten so good today that not only can we do it with no operative mortality or minimal operative mortality and minimal complications, we can do it safely in these patients that are at high risk for developing cardiovascular events and other complications if we don't treat the disease. So I think the, the conclusion of this study was that this trial does provide the evidence for using an early preemptive aortic valve replacement strategy over a conservative management strategy because it significantly reduces the rates for operative or cardiovascular death and death from any cause in these asymptomatic patients with very severe aortic stenosis. This trial, rightly, was published in the New England Journal of Medicine. Personally, I think this is a very, very important trial and certainly practice changing. You, if you look at the data, there's also data coming out of um, Southeast Asia I believe it was a Japanese study that looked at rates for using early AVR among patients with even severe aortic stenosis, asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis, showing maybe similar trend towards benefit. So I don't think we have a randomized control trial for asymptomatic severe aortic stenosis, but you could argue that you could use some of these, you could uh, extrapolate some of the results from this very severe aortic stenosis population to the severe aortic stenosis population possibly. Again, this study was not done in a Western population. I don't see how rep replicating this study here would, would, uh, would matter as much to change practice. We will see whether guidelines reflect this, of course, over time. The other thing it helps in sometimes is it makes exercise physiologists and your exercise labs very nervous when you ask to exercise these very severe aortic stenosis patients. And this study gives you a way out of that, then you may not have to exercise these patients and go through that process. However, saying that there is some safety data doing that, but, but like I said, you know, there's always a concern when you start exercising these severe or very severe aortic stenosis patients in your exercise labs um, whether or not it is safe. And uh, maybe we don't need to do that anymore based on the results from this study. There was another in interesting trial that was not presented at AHA. However, we thought it was very important to go over it, which was the Apple Watch study. So the last few minutes of this, pre of this podcast today will be spent discussing the Apple Watch study with Jalaj Gurg, who is an electrophysiologist who practices out of the Medical College of Wisconsin. You'll be hearing more about him in future episodes, of course, because Jalaj and I have, have started this EP heart failure series where we'll try to get expertise from both fields on topics uh, because there's so much overlap between these two, these two fields. Uh, if you are not interested in this study, please, please feel free to move on to the next episode. But it, it's a study that created a lot of press, a lot of excitement as well, because Apple Watches there are everywhere. I mean, millions of people have these watches, and it's, it's an interesting sort of novel study. In the last part of our episode today, we will discuss the Apple Heart Study. To discuss this study, I welcome Jalaj Garg, who is an academic electrophysiologist 
up at the Medical College of Wisconsin. Jalaj recently completed his electrophysiology training at one of the busiest centers in the country at Mount Sinai um, in New York. And uh, you'll be hearing more from Jalaj because we will be doing the Heart Failure EP series together. Welcome, Jalaj. Thank you, Mike. Today, what we're going to do is we're going to we're going to talk about the Apple Watch study that was recently published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And uh, we have Jalaj today who's going to go over the study, the results, and what it really means. So, Jalaj, you could tell us a little bit about the study today and and what it what kind of participants it looked at and who was in the study. Um, so, in the study, as you know, is titled as Large Scale Assessment of a Smartwatch with Identify Atrial Fibrillation. So, the whole idea of the study was to assess atrial fibrillation burden in healthy participants. So, the study was sponsored by Apple, and um, and the major criteria for enrollment for the participants were they need to have an I, Apple Watch, either one, two, or three series. All patients who have uh, the latest version of Apple Watch, which can give a single read. Single lead ECG recording were excluded. In addition, they were supposed to have an iPhone 5S or a higher version with OS at least 11. So those were the essential participants in the study. And any patient is 22 and beyond, and any and resident of any state in the United States were included in the study. Yeah, I was looking up the cost for these devices, and certainly the Apple Watch, at least the newest version, is is a $400 base price. And you can get additions, and it can cost as high as seven hundred dollars. The iPhone itself is not inexpensive, so certainly these devices are not inexpensive. Absolutely, but but if you look on the flip side, I feel that that's a that's a lot of cost to have two electronic devices or two wearable devices to be with you, and I'm not even sure that all those devices or the cost would be reimbursed by the insurance. Practically speaking, if I have a patient in the clinic and if I tell them just to do a monitor on their watch, I'm not sure if a watch shows a fibrillation would insurance reimburse for the cost for the Apple Watch. Yep. No, no, absolutely. I, I certainly don't think they would. Yeah. Going into the study, you know, so this is a prospective single group, open label, sightless, because there was really no medical sight involved, pragmatic study. And uh, the research protocol was approved by the Institutional Review Board at Stanford University because they had investigators from Stanford and by a central institutional review board uh, at Advara. Like you said, Apple sponsored the study. They owned all the data. All the study data was saved or stored at Stanford on their data platforms. So that's sort of a collaboration, I guess, between a corporation like Apple and, and an academic center like Stanford to come together to publish publish a study of this uh, scale. So, Jalaj, maybe you could tell us how they monitored the patients and what were the study interventions? So, before we go over that, it's, it is interesting to note that study enrollment was only for eight months. That is from November 2017 to August 2018, and they managed to enroll around 419,000 patients in the study, which is a very high number of patients in a short period of time. And but partly the reason I feel about that is the AFib is increasingly common and there's a lot of awareness among, and among people that AFib can cause stroke. So I think most of the volunteers or most of the participants just wanted to have an idea whether they do have AP fibrillation or not and can it be done at a high-tech and a zero-effort way other than going to a physician's office and having a patch. That, and that might be essentially the reason why they managed to enroll a huge number of patients. So the study essentially had two co-primary outcomes. Uh, it was the atrial fibrillation duration less than 30 seconds on an ECG patch monitoring, which was essentially mailed to the patients when they have a notification. And the secondary outcome along with the primary outcome was that there has to be a simultaneous recording of atrial fibrillation on an ECG patch which correlate with the irregular pulse notification on, on the watch. They used optical sensors on these variable devices, on these watches, to detect the pulse. And then and it looks like they had an algorithm in place to identify irregularity in pulses, which alerted the wearer of the watch to contact a physician in a telehealth sort of manner? Yes. And I think this is this 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 market of this technology is moving, and I don't think it's just Apple. I think if you look over uh, 
uh, look over their different companies like Fitbit and even like Orange Theory, they have been having the same optical sensors. All they do is they have the waveforms uh, from the uh, from the blood flow in the blood vessels and they generate a, uh, a tachogram having a difference in the pulse pressure which gives a notification that they might be an irregular pulse. That irregular pulse mm-hmm. may not may not always translate into atrial fibrillation. That's a separate story. Patients can have premature ventricular contractions or just sinus arrhythmia or even yeah, uh, premature atrial contractions. But that's how they we call a change in pulse pressure as a irregular notification. Fair enough. So sounds like they they reached out to someone using telehealth, and then these patients that were somewhat stable received a patch in their mail were expected to put the patch on for a week and then mail it back. So there's a lot of steps that went down. So maybe we can break the numbers down as to 420,000 participants and then maybe how many were able to accomplish all these subsequent steps and how many patients do we actually have data from. So um, out of 420,000 patients, only around 2,100 patients had a notification. But not all 2,100 patients who had notification were analyzed towards the end of the study. So out of these 2,100 patients, only 950 patients were initially enrolled. Others were excluded because of various reasons. Either they were unable to initiate a video teleconferencing with the physician after the notification. Out of those 950 patients who were initially enrolled in the first study visit, 660 patients had an ECG patch shipped. Out of these, only 450 patches were analyzed. The remaining 200 were excluded either because the patch, there was a discrepancy in the date and the time of the patch was mailed, or the patch uh, was mailed back more than 45 days ago, or patient inadvertently remembers that he has a history of atrial fibrillation, he or she has a history of atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter, or are, are taking anticoagulation. I so see. Toward, towards the end, it was only 450 participants uh, ECG patches that were analyzed. So that's 0.1% of everybody who wore the watch or participated in the study. Once once you had these patients, like you said, 450 uh, patch interpretations available, how much atrial fibrillation uh, did the investigators notice? So they noticed around 153 uh, participants' uh, patches had atrial fibrillation, which translates into around 34%. So there were 153 participants' patches who were analyzed who had atrial fibrillation, so which was which translates into 44 percent. But if you take down the eight cutoffs, uh, we essentially see that patient participants were 65 and um, older. There were 35 diagnostic ease of the patch to heal atrial fibrillation was 35 percent. But among those who were younger than 40 years of age, the diagnostic ease was um, 18 percent. 34 percent. It looked like patients were diagnosed with atrial fibrillation. When I was looking at the supplementary for this study, it actually broke down the timing of how much atrial fibrillation burden existed in these patients. I was hoping maybe you could tell us a little bit about that so that we can provide some context because we we don't truly know, but we believe that one minute of atrial fibrillation is not necessarily the same as having 24 hours of atrial fibrillation. Yeah, absolutely, and if you go over the numbers um, of one one hundred and fifty three participants who had atrial fibrillation confirmed on a patch, only twenty percent had a continuous atrial fibrillation. However, um, remaining participants had less AFib less than fifty percent of the time, um, and eighty nine percent of participants had an episode lasted at least an hour. Um, now, now the question arises is that. Is this an hour episode of atrial fibrillation a clinical significance that patients should be initiated in an anticoagulation or an invasive intervention like a direct current cardioversion, initiation of antiarrhythmic or having a catheter ablation should be performed? That all boils down to we don't know at this time. Yeah. Well, one of the things I think was the positive predictive value of this technology that came, came up. And... Uh, Maybe you could t- tell us a little bit about that. Yes, so essentially they they analyzed around uh, 2100 irregular tachograms. So in order for them to calculate a positive predictive value, they have to have at least five out of six abnormal tachograms from a from a single event to qualify it for an irregular notification followed by a patch to be delivered to a participant. So of uh, 
2089 patches or uh, irregular typograms they analyzed they found that around 1500 pay- participants had an irregular typogram which coincided with a notification for or coincided with the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation on ECG patch giving a positive predictive value of 0.71 the end of the study survey was quite important because it revealed some interesting findings and i was wondering if maybe we could go into some of the findings from this end of the study survey among patients who ended up sending information you know patients that had an abnormal pulse algorithm versus those who did not yes so so the numbers are very important here because um, it might it, it seems to be confusing on initial read on the paper so the end of the survey note is totally different from the participants who either were enrolled in and had a patches delivered or not so out of 420000 patients enrolled in the study around 300000 patients had were in the no notification subgroup so remaining 120000 patients were essentially were those participants who did not complete the survey towards the end in the notification subgroup there were around 929 participants who completed the survey towards the end and if you look for the diagnosis of atrial fibrillation there were around 400 participants in the notification subgroup which gives a uh, 43% of the participants having atrial fibrillation towards the end as compared to 3000 participants in the no notification subgroup which comes out around 1% just by the absolute numbers the numbers are you know, uh, around 7 to 8 times but again by going by the proportional value that it is 1% in the no notification subgroup Yeah I just thought it was interesting that out of patients who did not actually receive uh, an, an um, alarm from the watch there was actually greater proportion of patients who reported atrial fibrillation I know yes. that the complexities we don't know if they were wearing the devices the whole time we don't truly really know how how much afib who diagnosed the afib it's a subjective number it's a survey based number but it's still relevant to know that 3000 patients reported a new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation that were never informed that they may have afib never really went through the algorithm designed in the study absolutely and even my uh, point is the use of aspirin in these patients if you notice there were around 340 patients were on aspirin which is like 36% as compared to 40000 patients in a non notification subgroup taking aspirin after um, was the end of the survey i mean at this point i barely prescribed aspirin to my patients for primary prevention as since the data on aspirin is is very sketchy there's really not a lot of data like you mentioned for using aspirin among patients with atrial fibrillation irrespective of their chance vasc or even if they're low chance vasc so i think you know to conclude we really saw was out of 420,000 patients who were enrolled 0.5% basically received an irregular pulse notification and among those with the initial notification who returned the ekg patch which ends up being roughly 450 patients so really 0.1% of everybody 84% of their subsequent notifications were confirmed to be atrial fibrillation yield is certainly greater for participants who were 65 years and older because those were the folks that had greater frequency of notification 3.2% of those 65 and older received notifications so almost six times as much as the as the overall population those patients uh, or those participants were underrepresented in the current study because i feel that the current study was more catered towards healthy participants or since it was easy to enroll most of the participants were uh, were younger actually than mm-hmm. and older and this is again a counterintuitive to the patients we see in real life for your typical relation most of my patient population is is beyond 70 years who have a new onset afib or in manage for persistent afib true no absolutely i was mentioning the out of pocket cost for using these devices and and, and these are expensive devices I I think it's still reasonable to remember that we don't always appreciate the out of pocket costs for using other devices in medicine like putting the cardionet on these patients or using using Holter monitors or using loop recorders 
the copay for a lot of these devices sometimes can be a significant sum for patients. So, so I guess I'm not saying they're equivalent, but I'm saying that techniques and methods we use today in practice are also not free for patients and, and have significant healthcare costs associated with detection for atrial fibrillation. Absolutely. And, and this brings up another point that since the data is owned by Apple, we, we've been seeing that for years and years that there has been breach in, breach in the security threats or breach in the private, the personal and the private information about the patients. So what, mm-hmm. what it translates down the, down the road is how many participants or how many patients in the real world would be agreeable to have their information being stored in, stored with private companies and time and again we often see the data breach. Just to close our, our discussion today, what, what are the limitations? You know, we went over some limitations, but what are the limitations that the, uh, the investigators noted in the trial? And maybe do you see this changing your practice in any way? Before we go with the limitations, I think the main message which the study should impart is not, the study was not trying to test the technology. So this is very important. The main idea is that since the technology is rapidly evolving and changing, we essentially can't the study was not designed to test the technology. The study was essentially designed whether we can use this existing technology to diagnose atrial fibrillation. And one of the major limitations is if we notice that out of 2,000 patients who had a notification, few patients were excluded because patients later on remember that they have atrial fibrillation. So essentially we are relying on more on the patient information than in a hardcore evidence that patients really have atrial fibrillation or being verifying the medications with their pharmacy. So that essentially can also underestimate the use of the, the current technology in diagnosing atrial fibrillation in these patients. I'm not sure it's going to change my practice at this time because we've been using, there have been existing technology for now, which is A, being reimbursed by the insurance. Second thing is most of my patients are, are elderly. So it would, I can imagine it would be hard for a patient to use his existing newer iPhones and an Apple Watch and be um, be on the go with the current technology. So I, I think that most of the physicians, including myself, um, would still prefer using the traditional methods of diagnosing a population. I do agree that those traditional methods may not be the right methods in the current day and age, but I think there is still the potential scope of improvement in this existing technology. That makes it handy and can be used in future if if things improve. Now that's a great point, Jalash. Thank you so much for your time. Technology is rapidly evolving, and I'm sure a few years from now we're going to have better tools to possibly look for these arrhythmias and maybe uh, do a better job than we did in this study. So thanks a lot for your time. Thank you, man. Thank you so much for listening. If you enjoyed our episode, don't forget to like, subscribe, and give us a high rating as it helps other listeners find us. You can leave your suggestion for topics, critiques, things you think we can do better. You can email us at heartsuccessteam at gmail.com. You can actually find us on our website at www.heartsuccess.info. Our website now also provides links to all the podcast providers where you can listen to this episode. You can find us on our Facebook page at Heart Success Team, or you can always reach me on Twitter at CardioBro.